Hello, everybody. This is Muqtadar Khan. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. Welcome to my show, Conversations, in which I talk about religion, politics, world affairs, contemporary reality in, in the US, US-Muslim relations, and other topics. But today, I'm going to talk to you about this excellent book, The Narrow Corridor, States, Societies, and the Fate of Liberty. This has been penned by two very famous economists, uh, Darren Ajimoglu of MIT and James A. Robinson, who teaches at the University of Chicago. They are the famous authors of a previous book, which they had written called Why Nations Fail. And this book was very well celebrated. It tries to explain why some nations have become poor, why some nations have prospered, and why some nations have uh, become powerful. So essentially arguing why some nations succeed and why some nations fail. Uh, I have used both the books in my class that I teach on the politics of developing nations. I used this for three, four years. Students really love this book. They find it interesting. It explains lots of things to them. Uh, and it triggers very interesting conversations in the classroom, definitely. The argument of this book is very simple. It essentially argues that the evolution of political institutions really determines uh, the future of a nation, whether it will become prosperous or whether it will remain poor. And they argue that there are primarily two types of institutions, those which are extractive institutions, which take resources away from society uh, and, uh, and therefore have a debilitating effect on society uh, and the state. And then there are those institutions which are inclusive. They really distribute wealth very well. They empower their citizens and therefore eventually lead uh, to successful and prosperous nations. Uh, they use very interesting analogies to make their point. They talk about North and South Korea, which basically means that the, the history is more or less shared, culture is shared, uh, ethnicity is shared, language is shared, but the only difference is the kind of political institutions they have. And you can see the difference uh, in prosperity between the two nations, North and South Korea. But the new book, uh, the Narrow Corridor. Uh, this is also re receiving rave reviews. Obviously, they are very important people. For example, Professor Darren Ajimoglu is the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics at MIT. He has received uh, the John Bates Clark Medal given to economists under age 40. He is just to have been the most significant contribution to economic thought and knowledge. In 2012, he was awarded the Irvin Pline Nemers Prize in Economics for work of lasting significance. And in 2016, he received the BBVA, BBVA Front Use of Knowledge Award in Economics, Finance, and Management for his lifetime contributions. So Ajimoglu definitely has an incredibly celebrated career, and his colleague James Robinson is no less, uh, he's one of the only nine professors at the University of Chicago who are designated uh, as uh, university professors. Uh, this book is fascinating in the sense that if you are not a political theorist and if you are not a comparative politics person, you are really going to enjoy this book. You might find it enlightening. Uh, you may also find uh, the examples that they cite as very, very illuminating. Uh, I call this book as illustrated because they use examples to illustrate their points. They're not exactly proofs of the theory that they are advancing, but they are more illustrative. Uh, so it's a highly illustrated book. It has examples uh, from history, from far away in the past uh, to, to essentially across the globe. So they look at the expanse across space and expanse across the time. My students found this book very interesting. It triggered a lot of interesting arguments. Uh, and it shows that the book is very accessible at the undergraduate level. And I would recommend lots of people who teach uh, elementary political theory, comparative politics to, to benefit from this book. But what is their argument? 
their argument is very simple. They claim the states which are successful in achieving some kind of an equilibrium between state power and societal power enter a narrow corridor that will eventually lead to liberty. It's like driving a car with one foot firmly on the accelerator and the other on the brake. So the wheels are spinning, but you're going nowhere. They call it the red queen effect. And that my friend will eventually lead you to liberty. Their starting point is Thomas Hobbes and pre-state societies. They argue like Thomas Hobbes, that in the state of nature, uh, people are afraid of political violence and their political philosophy is shaped by Hobbesian realism and John Locke's liberalism. People live in fear of violence and they, they live lives which are nasty, brutish and short, somewhat like the lives of African-American youth in today's America. But they argue that hope begins with the emergence of the Leviathan a powerful political entity that can provide security in exchange for submission and obedience. And thus order emerges from anarchy, but there is a risk that this Leviathan, which could either be a king conquering the territory or a group of people coming together uh, and creating a political entity through a covenant or through a social contract. Either way, this Leviathan that provides security and safety uh, can also become despotic if it accumulates too much power. So societies either live in anarchy in a stateless condition, like maybe today's Syria, maybe today's Iraq, Somalia, states which we call as failed states. The people lived in societies which are anarchical by, by and large, stateless, in which they are perpetually afraid of political violence, or they live in states uh, which have a Leviathan-like entity, which then can become despotic. However, if a balance is drawn between the two, some kinds of norms, some kinds of agreements come into place uh, through an empowerment of the civil society or the society itself. And so there is a balance of power between the power of the state and the power of society. Then it is possible to shackle the Leviathan. And so now you have a state which has the power to protect, but it is also constrained by its citizens. And it is in this state that there is the hope that eventually liberty will emerge. Liberty does not emerge right away. Even in the corridor, there is a possibility of violence. See their pictorial presentation of the narrow corridor and you realize that at the end of the corridor, there is liberty uh, as there is a kind of balance between the power of the state and the power of the society. I found something very interesting about this. Uh, it clearly shows, at least their diagram and their argument, that liberty is, or freedom or democracy is essentially a product of the capacity of states. So the end of the corridor is where the state capacity is extremely developed. So in order to have a powerful state and a powerful society, you have to have uh, enhancement of capacities, I guess, both of the state as well as society. So once this theory is developed, essentially, then you have to have a balance between state and society. Most comparative politics scholars have been making this case for decades that you cannot have democracy in society without a strong civil society. Uh, we cannot have a strong government or a Congress without also having a strong ACLU and other social organizations, uh, which essentially act as check and balance on the power of the state. So in the rest of the book, the authors then go into the past uh, and then they try to explain practically every country under the sun as to why it is uh, one of the three or four types of states that they imagine. They imagine a state which is a despotic uh, Leviathan. They use China as an example of that. Or you, they can look at an anarchical state where there is uh, no state at all. They call it the absent Leviathan. And then you have the shackle Leviathan, their ideal. And the two states that they mention in their model are UK and the United States, which are interesting examples in themselves. 
But their historical narratives does not dwell much upon enlightenment from where a lot of the ideas which empower civil society and democracy, including Thomas Hobbes and John Locke come, uh, the two intellectuals who shape much of their political philosophy. Nor do they look at the impact of colonialism and imperialism on the rest of the world, especially Asia and Africa, where there clearly is an absence of liberty in many societies. But nevertheless, they, they make for interesting reading. I have looked at only three examples uh, from the many examples that they have. Uh, and I looked at those examples which interest uh, and correspond to my own research. Uh, so for example, in chapter three, they talk about the emergence of the first Islamic state uh, under the guidance of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They argue that the advent of Islam was essentially uh, the society in Arabia, especially in the city of Medina, moving from a stateless condition into a pristine state. But to my delight, they talk about the covenant of Medina, which often many historians, even Muslim historians, uh, overlook. It is through the through the constitution of Medina that the first Islamic state was born. It was through a social contract. And Prophet Muhammad governed Medina, not by virtue of being a prophet, by, but by virtue of getting consent through a social contract called the Medinan uh, constitution. In my book, Islam and Good Governance, this one, uh, I have discussed uh, the Medinan state in, in some detail, and I have talked about the nature uh, of the Medina constitution and its implications. But I have some bones to pick uh, with Ojimoglu and Robinson. Uh, they argue uh, that ultimately the state of Medina became a kind of a despotic leviathan uh, and there were no rules and norms that uh, constrained it. One interesting aspect of this book is that they create a lot of metaphors. They articulate a lot of metaphors uh, like the shackled Leviathan, the despotic Leviathan, uh, the Red Queen, the caged, uh, the cage of uh, norms and values. Uh, it, it makes for interesting reading and discussion. Uh, but they don't recognize the fact that the Quran uh, as a source of ethics and law did act as a cage of norms on the way the Medinan state operates it. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not governing by his whim, but he was governing by either the constitution of Medina or some of the rules and norms that were revealed to him. So, so there was some shackling of the state of Medina. Uh, and I think that their reading of the state of Medina does disservice to the state of Medina, especially its importance uh, in the possibility of promoting a pluralistic and democratic uh, statehood in the Muslim world today. In my reading, I found the state of Medina a pluralistic constitutional state, which explicitly recognizes Jews, Muslims, and others as one ummah based on a social contract. So that is my one problem. And then there's also a little tiny problem in which they refer to raids conducted by Prophet Muhammad as crusades. The use of the word crusades for activities of Prophet Muhammad and his companions, I thought was at best odd. Uh, for those who are more interested in the Medinan state, I would invite them to read my book. In chapter four, they discuss the ideas of Ibn Khaldun. Uh, I find that take on his tax policies and how Ibn Khaldun's ideas on taxation actually influenced Ronald Reagan uh, and his uh, view of economics. Uh, and I want to share a, a video in which uh, Ronald Reagan actually talks about um, Ibn Khaldun, and you can see that here. I studied economics in college when I was young, and I learned there about a man named Ibn Khaldun who lived 1,200 years ago in Egypt. And 1,200 years ago, he said, in the beginning of the empire, the rates were low, the tax rates were low, but the revenue was great. He said, in the end of the empire, when the empire was collapsing, the rates were great and the revenue was low. But their understanding of Ibn Khaldun's political philosophy is quite rudimentary. 
uh, there is much to more to Ibn Khaldun than the idea of just Asabiya, the famous idea with which is associated Asabiya is a kind of ethnic and communal solidarity and through which um, random groups of people become a powerful force because they identify with each other and from that Asabiya a state can emerge. Ibn Khaldun actually talks about various kinds of states. Uh, for example, he describes three types of state states which are natural, uh, in which the rulers essentially come to power through force and pursue self-interest. Then he talks about rational states, which are very much like uh, close to the idea of a, a beginning stage of a shackled uh, Leviathan, where uh, in a rational state, the rulers are seeking to advance the public interest of the people and not uh, advance the power and wealth uh, of uh, the ruling class. And then Ibn Khaldun talks about the divine state or the religious state where the rulers are seeking the well-being in this world and the hereafter. So you can talk of, about it as a virtuous state that is trying to pursue some kind of virtue. And finally, in their chapter 8, they talk about Ibn Khaldun in chapter 4. In chapter 8, they talk about India. This is a terrible chapter. This is perhaps the worst chapter in the book. Rather than eliminate or vindicate their arguments, it merely exposes their utter lack of knowledge about India, its history, and its contemporary politics. They provide a monocausal explanation for India's lack of liberty and its poverty, the caste system. They have discovered the caste system. And they say that it's essentially because of the caste system in India that India lacks liberty and India is poor. First of all, India is in the same boat as France and US according to the European, uh, the Economic Intelligence Unit, which produces the Democracy Index. France, US, and India all fall in the same category. They're all flawed democracies. From their book, you would gather that the US is on one side of the spectrum and India on the other of the tyranny to freedom spectrum. But really, if you look at the Democracy Index, which is far more rigorous than their book, India, France, and the US are all flawed democracies. Having pointed that out, I also want to say that reading of the history is very superficial. They seem to assume that the caste system in India has remained the same for centuries without being impacted by anything. India was governed by Muslims for a thousand years uh, and Islam and Muslim values have left some impact on India. And after that, India was governed by one of their role models, the British, the UK, for nearly 200 years, and so the British Enlightened Corridor ideas also governed India for nearly two decades, two centuries. Uh, and then subsequently, India has been independent for nearly 75 years, in which it has done much to uplift the untouchables, bring about social reforms in India. Uh, India has an affirmative program, which it calls reservations, which sometimes leads up to 40 to 48%. Uh, seats in schools, in universities, in jobs, in public sectors reserved uh, for the untouchables and people from backward classes. So there has been significant attempt to uplift them. And India has been successful uh, to such an extent that the so-called untouchables today, uh, by and large, are economically more developed than the religious minorities like Muslims who are nearly 200 million in India. So I think their reading of India is really woeful and awful, really terrible. Uh, it also exposes, especially the chapter, it exposes two methodological deficiencies in their book. Number one, these, these monocausal explanations that you have one cause of some complex reality. Yes, caste system is a problem in India and it continues to remain a problem and probably will remain a problem for time to come. However, that is not the only cause of India's uh, enduring poverty, which is shrinking, but still there are millions in India who are very poor. And the decline uh, of uh, freedoms and democracy in India in recent years is not because uh, of the caste system, but in spite of that. Um, nevertheless, the second point is that this ambitious attempt to develop 
a theory that explains every country in the world uh, is an interesting and intellectual exercise, but not really um, something that will provide you with uh, rigorous results. So I think these are the two methodological problems that come out from the case in India. One, that monocausal arguments uh, tend to be weak. And number two, that uh, you cannot come up with a theory that will explain every country uh, country's uh, evolution. Uh, nevertheless, it's a fun book. Uh, and uh, undergraduates would really enjoy reading it. It will definitely trigger interesting debates. Uh, and given its breadth, almost every student in your class, uh, no matter what their interest is, Latin America, Africa, East Asia, uh, contemporary era, the US, racism, etc. they will find something uh, to talk about and argue about. So congratulations to Darren Ajimoglu and James Robinson for this interesting book. Uh, uh, no book is perfect, uh, neither is this. Uh, and um, I hope to sometime be able to invite them to my show, Conversations, so they can talk about it uh, or maybe talk about their next project. So please, uh, if you have liked this discussion, subscribe to the channel Conversations, uh, like this video, make your observations, share this with your friends. Uh, and until next time, this is Mukhtar Khan, the Khan of Conversations. Take care.